You know, as a, as a guy who grew up in Victoria, Texas, I never imagined that the things God would allow me to experience and the places he'd allow me to go. Uh, Rhonda and I had a unique opportunity to go to Peru with uh, Compassion International, see their work, and then uh, just here a couple weeks ago. And then as a part of that, because we were in the neighborhood, to uh, go to the ancient Incan city of Machu Picchu and to see uh, this, it's an incredible place and one of those one of those bucket list places uh, in the in the world that wow what what, a, what an incredible view and what to God be the glory for uh, the heavens declare the glory of God his creation all around the mountains all those things and the then the air in the Andes mountains it's just beautiful so uh, saw that place now there are a lot of places in our own country I still haven't seen. One of those places is uh, Yellowstone National Park. How many of you have been to Yellowstone? I think it makes me feel badly about myself. And, uh, and so if you're going to go to Yellowstone, there's for sure one thing you're going to have to take a picture of, and that is yourself, because you're, you're that kind of people. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna, yeah, you've already read the bulletin, so Old Faithful's probably somewhere in that answer, right? Yeah, Old Faithful. And there are other geysers that are, that are more impressive, but, but boy, the thing about Old Faithful is you can just count on it. Every 65 minutes or so, about 170 feet in the air, there's going to be this spout of, wa- of boiling water that flies up into the air, and it's pretty spectacular, and you just know it's coming. And you can be sure you're going to get the picture of it while you're there if you'll just schedule a, just a short amount of time. And the reason it's the most popular thing to take a picture of at Yellowstone is because it's faithful. We value faithfulness in this world. It's a quality I think all of us admire, aspire to. We don't, we ought to. And when it comes to faithfulness, not only does God, does God admire faithfulness in us, but he requires it of us. This is not one of the options about following the Lord. Faithfulness is foundational and doesn't make any difference. If you go through life with people, it doesn't... There are people with great ability, there are people with great giftedness, great personality, intelligence, work really hard, but if you can't depend on them, they're not going to be very helpful to you. They're going to be one of your sources of greatest frustration when, when there are people who are just going, to, just going to come up short. Faithfulness is so key. And what do we mean by faithfulness? Just to give it some, some words, wrap some words around it, integrity, honesty, trust worthiness, loyalty, can you be counted on? That's, that's what faithfulness is about. And it's one of the fruit of the Spirit that we've been focusing on in these weeks. Now, the writer of Proverbs, in Proverbs 20, verse 6, he said, Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. Plenty of people are full of words about what they'll do and what they're about and what's important to them. But the one who actually does what they said, who is going to be faithful in all areas of life, well, the writer there, Proverbs, said they're just hard to come by. This is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul talks about it as when you have a relationship to God, you have made a commitment of your life to Jesus, you have surrendered your life to Him, you are a follower of Jesus, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. God the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. And when God the Holy Spirit is in you and you are leaning into that relationship, a daily surrender of your life to Him, there's certain things that start springing up in you. And those things are called the fruit of the Spirit. And they are manifestations of the character of God. We already see all these things in in the nature of Jesus as He interacts with people, as He goes through the Gospels. We see it in Jesus. We see it in the character of God, the Old Testament, New Testament, how He does things, who He is. And as you lean into this relationship to Jesus Christ, these things start not just showing up in you, but, but overflowing out of your life into the lives of the people around you and into a world that desperately needs a testimony of something that is otherworldly, something that is eternal, something that, that truly reflects Jesus the Christ. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, we've shared this every week as we have looked at the different fruit of the Spirit, these nine things. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness. Today, faithfulness. Next week, gentleness. And the week after, self-control. And Paul, this is about, and against such things, there is no law. No, one's, no one is, is wanting to push these things back. They want to see these things grow and develop, mature, overflow. Even our United States Constitution has the word faithfulness in it. It says in the, in the presidential oath of office, the president should, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the president of the United States. It's a big deal everywhere. Everyone expects faithfulness. So it's an important word. We're going to talk about faithfulness. We'll talk about it in two different directions to kick off. First thing, God's faithfulness to us. Second, what does our faithfulness look like? So here we go. First, we trust that God is faithful to us. You just learn to trust that he's going to be faithful. Like all the flavors of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gentleness, self-control, those, these things, they're all, gonna, they're all going to uh, actually find their origins in the nature of God, in who God is and what God's about, how God does things. It is core to his character, to his nature. Uh, today, uh, just because it's such a foundational verse on faithfulness, we're going to look at Lamentations chapter 3. Don't spend a lot of time with Lamentations. It comes right after the book of Jeremiah. It's written by Jeremiah. Lament, by the way, I love going to bookstores with books. You keep your Kindle to yourself. I want to see a page turning. That's how, that's how God made the world to be. So I like, I like to have a book with pages to turn, and I like to go to bookstores when you can find a dinosaur like that still and, and just go through the shelves looking at books. And I look at the titles. I look at uh, the cover. What's going to draw me in? What's of interest to me? If you're going along and you find a, a book cover and it says Lamentations, you say, and what else is available? Because it doesn't sound like the most, most exciting topic you're going to cover probably in your uh, reading. Lamentations written by Jeremiah, who is described as the weeping prophet by Bible scholars. Again, sounds like a fun guy to hang out with, kind of guy you'd want to vacation with, the weeping prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is... Lamentations, he, he's describing his whole world caving in. He loves his people and he loves his land and he loves Jerusalem and he loves the temple. What's happened is, and in response to him warning and warning and trying to push his people toward God, they went the other direction as a people. And, and the Babylonians came in and they, they destroyed Jerusalem to a level that, that is described in the Bible, no stone was left upon another. And they destroyed the temple. And they hauled off God's people, almost all of them, except the poorest of the poor. They hauled them off to Babylon in exile. And here's Jeremiah. And his world has fallen down around him. And everything he loves has been destroyed. And everything seems so dark. And so that's the book of Lamentations. And as you read through, you feel the heaviness of it. You feel the weight of the burden of his life and the, the hurt in his heart for everything he holds dear. And then... This is why you read the whole Bible. Because buried in the middle of it is Lamentations chapter 3. And there's a couple of little verses there that say this. Verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. And then he declares, great is your faithfulness. Man, I need to hear that. I need to hear it when it's heavy. I need to hear it when it's a, a today when everything's going the way I want it to be. I uh, want it to go. want it to roll. I, I, I need to hear it. God is faithful. And sometimes it's in those darkest times of life that his faithfulness comes most to the surface. 1923, there's a guy named Thomas Chisholm, blazed the new Chisholm Trail. And that same year, he wrote a poem about God's faithfulness, and he put it to music, and it's one of my favorite songs, and we sang it earlier. Now, I've been singing it for a long time, and for some of you, you sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and the King james English of it, and I'm going to uh, trip you up, a little odd, um, growing up in Victoria, Texas, only on holidays did my family use thee and thou in our ordinary conversational language. 
You guys will go with anything. And I, I may need to get you all to move closer to the front because you're just hiding back there and you think I can't see you, but I see you. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions, they fail not, as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Now you ought to be able to sort through that, the end thou, pretty easily. My favorite verse, pardon for sin, a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence, great presence, one version says, to cheer and to guide, strength for today, and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with, with 10,000 beside. It just keeps on coming. And then the chorus, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Now, I grew up here in this in church as a, as a young child, pre-reader, before I could read. Now, I'm not good at songs, uh, and about those of you who, who heard me do a full verse of a Tom T. Hall song a few weeks ago, you, well, hey, I can amen that. You don't know. You should never sing out loud. Well, there are a lot of songs that I think I know the words. That's why I, I don't do karaoke things because I always think I know the words to songs and then come to find out I'm not even close. I'm just making stuff up and it's ugly. So, with this song, it's one that I, and I recall vividly as a kid, I'm singing along and I'd, I'd bust out in song uh, and sing, great is my faithfulness, because thy didn't make any sense, but my did, so I'd sing it that way. Truth is, my faithfulness, uh, not so great. But there has never been a moment in my life when God has not been faithful. The Apostle Paul says, if we are faithless, if, if we fall down everywhere when it comes to faith, if we are faithless, he still remains faithful. John the Apostle wrote, if we confess our sins, oh my goodness, we have sinned cosmic treason against the creator of the universe. But it, even then, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, the Apostle Paul, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. Oh, temptation is going to come. That's a promise. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He's faithful. Psalm 86, 5 tells us God is abounding in love and faithfulness. Psalm 100 verse 5 tells us that God's faithfulness continues through all generations. He's not going anywhere. Our God is faithful. But, but you have to, <laughs> there's a lot of things in the Bible like that. Is God faithful? Yes, God is faithful, says my head. And when difficulty comes, when crisis and tragedy wrap me up, when well, moving that from my head to my heart is vitally important. It's not just knowing it, not just being able to say it, but it's to feel it when everything seems so very heavy. And there is my ongoing personal challenge when it comes to the faithfulness of God. When trouble and tragedy afflict us, we wonder, what is God doing? But Boy, my experience, and we went through some dark things just a few years ago and felt so heavy every day and so dark every day. And, and, and it was in those times that... Kind of like with Jeremiah in the middle of that book of Lamentations. That's when God's faithfulness was proven most real, most powerful, most all-encompassing, most, most eternal. We know, second, that God rewards our faithfulness. God doesn't just admire faithfulness, appreciate faithfulness. He, he requires faithfulness and he's measuring it out. The church in Smyrna in the book of Revelation, one of the seven churches of the Revelation, this is, this is the word Jesus gives to them. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. A couple of things about that. Sometimes faithfulness is going to cost you something. It may even cost you your very life. But you be faithful 
to the end. And there's an eternal reward waiting for you. God rewards the faithful life. Give you another word for faithfulness. It's good old-fashioned stick to itiveness. That's one of those examples. I don't think it was Shakespeare that came up with that one, but Shakespeare was known to make up words when he needed a word. Stick to itiveness is a pretty good word. It means faithful is not just when it works out, when I can fit it into the calendar. Faithful is day to day, week to week, year to year, a leaning of your life, an inclination of your heart in the same direction, a long obedience, we might say, in the same direction. Not just doing something once here or there. It's being faithful. A good synonym for faithfulness, just to give you, a, sometimes different words are helpful. A good, a good synonym for faithfulness is loyalty. Are you, are you loyal? How loyal are you? And I want to I just touch on, you see some of these things coming at you in the outline. Some things that, that show the variety, like, it, like all the fruit of the Spirit. You, you can't manufacture faithfulness. It's something that God does in you as you lean into a relationship to Him. As you surrender more and more of your life to Jesus, these things become more and more swelling up in us. And here's some areas where faithfulness is really important. And faithfulness is not just something that you say in some sort of isolation chamber. I am faithful. Faithfulness is something that happens in relationship to God, in relationship to the world around us, in relationship to the circles of influence in our life. Faithfulness, faithfulness shows up in tangible ways. And I want to touch on some of those tangible ways the Bible talks about faithfulness. Here's the first one. Be a loyal family member. How about that? Husbands and wives are to be faithful to one another. If, if you say, I am faithful to my wife, I mean, I grade out as an A. I am 92% faithful to my wife. How's the wife going to feel about that? Not so, just in case you weren't sure, not so good. Faithfulness is consistent and it's all the time. Uh, parents, are you faithful to your children? Oh man, whatever age your children, you know, your kids are counting on you. And when you fail and falter, when integrity becomes uh, negotiable in your world, and I see so many examples of this in so many places over so many years, it just reverberates out and it devastates kids. Kids, are you faithful to your parents? Boy, when a, when a child, at, at, especially as they're getting older, when they choose and that they do things that are unfaithful uh, to, to mom and dad, to their, to their wish, to their, to their will, to, to their teaching, oh my goodness, how it, how it affects a marriage, how it affects mom and dad's marriage, how it affects mom and dad's sense of well-being when, when the kids make choices that are contrary to... Contrary to biblical values, the traditional family is under such attack in our, in our nation, in our world. And what we find is that Satan knows that if he can attack the building block of a society, which is the family, he can break down a nation and he can break down God's plan for the world. And so he's coming after families. You're under attack. When things are great in your family, uh, loyalty comes easy. But when families go through tough times, that's the time we need to elevate the value of faithfulness to one another, loyalty to one another. There's a beautiful verse in Proverbs that speaks about the value of this loyalty, faithfulness. It says, like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. Faithless. That's, that's descriptive. Um, as I've gotten older, I've spent more and more time in the medical community. My doctor visits all begin the same way. You know, Chad, at your age, that's just being hurtful. But that's how they all start now. And I've made it to this stage of life. I've never had a toothache my whole life. That's, that's good for me. But oh, about a year ago, well, I had a flat tire on my right foot. And every step just turned me inside out. It hurt so bad. And, and it took a long time to get that remedied. And I spent a lot of time with a group of doctors to try to make that better. You got a bad foot, it's going to affect you. You got a bad tooth, it's going to affect you. And he says, if you've ever had that experience, 
that's a pretty good description, (laughs) we'll say, of how miserable families are when family members are unfaithful. Be a loyal friend. Be a faithful friend. That's the next thing. Uh, you, You don't always choose your family, but you can certainly choose your friends. And if you can go through this life, and I'm not talking about, well, I have lots of friends. You should see my Facebook profile. Well, that's not the kind of friends I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who are going through life with you, who really care about you, who are going to be there no matter what, who are going to be faithful, loyal friends. Side by, a friend loves at all times. That's faithfulness. And a brother is born for adversity. Well, when adversity comes, that's when you need a faithful friend. A few years ago, a national magazine did a contest. And the contest was, give a, like a sentence to describe what friendship is. What is a true friend? And here are a couple of honorable mentions. One of them said, a friend is someone who multiplies your joys and divides your sorrows. Another said, a friend is someone who understands your silence. Even when you can't speak, they still, they're not going to bail on you. They're going to be with you. They're going to stand by you, even in your silence. The winning entry said, a friend is someone who walks in when all the world has walked out. Uh, pretty good. Sometimes folks say, well, I wish I had a friend like that. I wish I had somebody that I'd count on like that. Someone just shoulder to shoulder with me. Some, somebody that I knew was not going to, they're going to be faithful. Not just for a season, but for a long time. That person you can call on any time and they're always going to be there. And If you have a handful of those in the course of a lifetime, count yourself most blessed to have that kind of person. How do you develop that? Well, you're going to have to do a little doing yourself. Here's what the Bible says. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. How about that? Don't wait for somebody to come and be that kind of friend to you. You've got to be the fr- friend like that to someone else. And before long, you're going to develop some friends that are always going to be faithful. Because you are a faithful friend. Third thing, and I just say this because when it comes to the word faithful, faithfulness, It shows up just about more times than any other place in relationship to being a loyal manager of God's money because that's tangible. And faithfulness is measured in a tangible way here. We talk about stewardship, and this is how the Bible talks about it. In fact, it talks about that word steward, and that's not a common word for us. We don't have that as a profession or people who, what's your job? Uh, I'm a steward necessarily, but a steward in the biblical times, steward, even uh, old England, there were stewards. And what they did is they, they managed an estate for an owner. Th- they lived in the house. They took care of the fields. They took care of the, managed the property and the flow in and out and everything about. They lived on the property. And from time to time, the owner would come and say, how's everything going? And they'd give an account to the, to the owner. And that's the idea. God is the owner of everything. And our responsibility is to be a steward. Is how Jesus paints the picture. In uh, these parables, he talks about we're to take care of what God has entrusted to us. We don't own it. We manage it on his behalf. It's not yours, it's his. If, if I don't think of my house, my car, my bank account is mine, it's easier for me to let go of it and to learn to be a generous person, to care about people. Many of you have learned this principle of generosity that when you think about it as God's instead of yours, it's it's not hard to say, I'm going to give to to help children around the world who just don't have a chance. I'm going to give generously to to the poor. I'm going to give generously to uh, missions around the world. I'm going to give generously to disaster relief. I'm, I'm going to give generously to my church. I'm going to give generously to kingdom purposes in the world. But when you don't think of it as yours, it's easier to be generous. When you think it's mine, 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 instead of all God's, uh, you can become uh, the wrong kind of money manager when it comes to God's stuff. What kind of manager are you? Jesus said, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. And then there's this weird sentence. 
If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? So always, if you're faithful in small things, God will start you out small. He won't, he won't throw a big job at you. He starts out small. If you're faithful in small things, he'll give you more opportunity, more opportunity. But here's what he says. If you can't even be faithful with your nickels and your dimes and your dollars, how can I entrust eternal things to you? There's the stuff that's really going to matter and last for eternity. If you're not even willing to, to just follow my money plan for everything else. When it comes to this, there's one overriding requirement. It is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Faithfulness is a key part of being a steward of God's resource. Uh, I read uh, this from a pastor. He said he had a really high-powered uh, business owner and a member of his church, and the guy said he, he hired pretty high-level people even for different positions in his company, and sometimes always a voice in just the entry-level employees. But he asked them all, made sure they all, whether he was doing the interview or someone else was doing it, they asked the same question. The question was, if I ask you to stand at a copier all day and make copies, would you be willing to do it? He asked that of the high-level folks. He said it was just a good diagnostic to see where the heart was. Are they too prideful to do small things? Are they too important to do small things? Are they willing to do whatever needs to be done? If they're not willing to do the small things, then how can you entrust the big things to them? Well, that's, that's how God goes at it too. The battle for character starts in the little thoughts you think and the little actions that you take. Faithfulness is paying attention to beginnings and to follow-throughs. It's the direction of faithfulness. Fourth thing, be a loyal church member. Well, the Bible talks about it this way. In Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Romans 12. So I belong to you, you belong to me, and we need each other. Depending on the person you ask, uh, there are a couple different ideas about this. How many one another's there are in the Bible? Some people say there are 53. Some people say there are maybe as many as 58 different one another's in the Bible, love one another, pray for one another, care for one another. It's the, the Christian life is not something you live as a solo act. It's not, well, it's just me and Jesus. There's a me and Jesus, but there's a we and Jesus to live the Christian life. And that's the only way it works because that's how God made it to work. So that's why those one another's, love one another, pray for one another, care for one another, encourage one another, all the one another's are lived out in the context of a thing that the Bible calls the church. And you have to be a committed part of a church. You can't be a come and go part of a church. You have to be a committed, faithful member of a church. I want to challenge you on this. You know, maybe you've, you've been looking for a church home months, years. Uh, you visit around. Sometimes you say, well, I'm going to go here this Sunday. Next Sunday, I'm going to go over here. And the next Sunday, I'll go over there. There are a lot of different ways people approach this. But, well, you can't be a Lone Ranger Christian just floating around out there. You need to be a part of a body. And what's the difference between a church attender and a church member? It's the same difference as being uh, a, couple, a, young, a couple that's living together and a couple that's married. And the difference between those two is there's a commitment that's been made, a commitment that's been declared. And we grow through our commitments. We don't go through our good intentions. We grow through our commitments. And we are always going to challenge you toward commitments, especially in relationship to the body of Christ, the church. So, an unashamed commercial. If you have not made a commitment to say, we're, we're part of this family, we're going to do this, come join me this afternoon from 3.30 to 5, and I'll get you out 5 till 5 today because I love you. First steps. It's just a class that tells you this is, what we, this is what's important to us as a church. This is what we believe as a church, especially about doctrines wrapped around salvation. You need to know that. This is how we're organized to do what we do. Um, and I'll be leading that. It, come, come be a part of it and see, is this where I want to be? And if it's not, you go find you somewhere else to be. And if this doesn't fit you, just tell me. And I'll tell you, because I've been here long. I've been here almost 21 years now. I know other churches in our area. You tell me what you're looking for, I'll tell you, well, here's, here's a good option for you for that. Here's where you may, may want to explore God over here. Because 
I don't care if we're building a kingdom here at First Baptist Church Allen, but I do want to build the kingdom of God. So we're going to find you a place to connect. That's what's going to be really important to, to, to us. The class may help to clarify some of those things for you. So come, you can sign up right back here at the Connection Center. I'll be there in just a moment after we're dismissed. Let me ask you this. Would anyone ever accuse you of, boy, you are really faithful to your church? Would anybody accuse you of that? Would, would that be something people would say about you? Think about it this way. If you were as faithful to your marriage or your job as you are to the church, would you still be married and would you still have a job? This is the bride of Christ. This is the body of Christ. That's how the church is described. You don't want to shortchange yourself on this. Be found faithful. When it comes to church stuff, uh, Hebrews 10.25 shows up in those discussions. and Eugene Peterson in the message, he did a paraphrase of this that uh, I enjoyed. This is how he paraphrased it. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching, the big days Jesus coming again. We want to be, we want to be found loyal faithful to God, faithful to his people, faithful to God's agenda and the gospel when he comes. Just a few things to note. Faithfulness is not optional. When when two people get married, they expect one another to remain faithful. Faithfulness is a part of the marriage contract. Faithfulness is a part of the deal in relationship to God too. That when you say, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ, There are things that happen as a result of that and there's obedient stuff that happens and there is being true to him that happens and loyal to him that's going to happen. And God expects us to be faithful, to consistently, over time, carry out his will. In 1 Samuel, God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. He's raising up a lot of faithful priests who will do what he's called us to do. We show our faithfulness by obeying him. His heart becomes our heart. His mind becomes our mind. And his will becomes our will. God looks for faithfulness in his servants. Jesus uh, tried to help us understand God's interest in trustworthiness. (laughs) A parable. His master said to him, on, at the end of your days, when you stand before God, and we will all stand before God, wouldn't you like for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You think about the examples of faithfulness in the Bible. Moses is a great example of faithfulness. Moses, he, uh, this description in Numbers 12, 7, he was faithful in all of God's house is what it says, which means Everywhere where he was called to function in relationship to God, he was found faithful. And he did that while leading a people that sometimes they were faithful and sometimes they just thumbed their nose at God and sometimes they they just run the other direction as fast as they could go, even worshiping idols. And these are the people he's going through life with. But he is going to be faithful whether anyone around him is or not. He made his notable mistakes, certainly not perfect but he consistently did God's will as best he could in all of God's house. In, uh, in the Bible, God speaks to people in different ways. And we, we see examples where he speaks to people in dreams. He speaks to people in visions. He, he stirs things in their hearts. But it says, Moses spoke to God face to face. God spoke to Moses face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. You want to get clarity in how God talks to you? Be found faithful. And his voice becomes clearer and closer, more distinct. Daniel is a good example of faithfulness. He had every reason to be unfaithful. He's, he's, all that lamentation stuff that Jeremiah lays down, and he and Daniel are, are contemporaries. And Daniel, he gets plucked up from his family, hauled off to Babylon, put in a leadership development program in the, to serve the, the empire that wrecked wrecked his heritage, and wrecked his own family. And here's what happens. As a young man, he's pulled out. And as a young man, he says, I'm going to remain faithful, even if it costs me something. And as he gets older, and he serves with a series of really, really broken leaders, he's still going to be faithful in his work, 
in his relationships to his friends, in his relationship to his God, he's always going to be faithful. He's going to do what God said to do. And so much, so much of being faithful is being willing to do it when it's an ungodly environment even. Listen to what Jesus, what Jesus is, what he's about, because he's our supreme example in all the fruit of the Spirit, even especially faithfulness. He always did God's will. He always spoke God's word. He always pursued God's agenda, and he had one desire. Not my will, but yours, his, God's, the Father's be done. How do you develop faithfulness? Because, say, oh, I want to be more faithful. Where do I start? Well, faithfulness to God because God's over everything, uh, there are any number of ways to attack it. Here's what I challenge you to do. Just pick one. I'm not going to be real, really legalistic about this. Just pick one out. You know, there's some things I could do. I can, I've already felt it. There's things I can do in relationship to my family, uh, things that people that live with me and around me, that if I can be more faithful in those things, uh, in your workplace... Boy, could you be known in your workplace, whatever you're doing, making widgets, whatever you do in your workplace, that you just be found as the most faithful employee there, doing, always leaning into it, always bringing your best. Could, could you be that employee? And, and with your friendships, I need to be more faithful as a friend. I'm going to I'm going to call, I'm going to reach out, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, hey, let's get, let's get together. Let me check on you. Hey, how can I pray for you with my friendships, relationship to church? What there, there's all these next steps. Just pick one. Because here's what happens with, with, with faithfulness. When you start being faithful in one area, you start bending your heart to God's heart. And what happens is faithfulness starts showing up everywhere. In all those different circles, in all those different environments where you function, faithfulness starts being elevated. And finally, Paul challenged. This is uh, 2 Timothy. This is right at the end of Paul's life. He's saying to Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. To be found faithful in the precious treasure of the gospel. That, okay, Jesus, Jesus transformed my life. Uh, he, he, my sin washed away. He has walked with me, given me hope and peace in all sorts of circumstances in, in the course of my life journey. I have this assurance of heaven one of these days. This is an incredible gift, the treasure of the gospel. And the question I want to pose this, are you being faithful with that treasure? We all know people who, who are far from God. Are, are, you, are, you, are you sharing? Are you praying? Are, are, you, are you seeking to, to make disciples? Because it's what Jesus told us to do just before he sent it into heaven. The last thing he says is probably a pretty big deal. And that's the last thing he lays on us big, make disciples. Are you, are you faithfully stewarding the precious gospel of Jesus Christ? And if not, oh my goodness, why not? It's your greatest, greatest privilege and your highest calling.